Bonjour tout le monde et merci de nous rejoindre ce soir pour notre présentation publique sur la cartographie des risques naturels pour Bear Brook et la rivière North Indian dans les côtés unis de Prescott et Russell. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us tonight for our public presentation on natural hazard mapping for Bear Brook and the North Indian River within the United Counties of Prescott and Russell. My name is John Messman and I'm South Nation Conservation Authority's Managing Director of Property, Conservation Land and Community Outreach. And I have the pleasure of being your moderator for the evening. For those listening in right now, we're about to get started and I'll share some meeting procedures while we wait for a few more people to tune in. We do expect this meeting to be about 30 to 40 minutes and we'll stay online to answer any questions that you might have. We will be delivering this presentation in English. However, our slides will also display in French on your screen and all of this content is available in French on our website at nation.on.ca slash consultations. Donc, nous ferons cette présentation en anglais. Uh, cependant, nos diapos s'afficheront également en français et tout ce contenu est disponible en français sur notre site web à nation.on.ca slash consultation. For those familiar with our usual consultation process, we really do enjoy the ability to meet people in person in their communities, usually in the closest arena or school, and to really sit down one-on-one -on -one and show you the maps for your property and talk about your experiences with flooding in your community or you know, where you might have noticed erosion on your property. However, due to our project uh, timelines, along with the often unpredictable winter season, And because we are also completing three separate consultations for three different areas within our region at the same time, we are making these presentations available online and we're providing an extended consultation timeline so that property owners may schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with staff after the presentation, either in person or online, uh, to review some specific mapping for their properties uh, throughout the month of March 2024. These meetings are also being recorded and will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. And for those online with us right now, please note that your videos and microphones are automatically turned off, so you don't have to worry about any potential feedback or IT issues. You're welcome to watch the presentation from wherever is most convenient and comfortable to you. Um, at any point in the presentation, you can ask questions. You can do so through the Q&A tab on your screen, which you can use to submit those questions at any time. And please do um, type in those questions as we go along at any point during the meeting, because there is about a 30 second lag between when we're actually speaking and the live broadcast that you're watching. So we may not actually see your question when discussing a particular topic, but our team is able to respond to them throughout the meeting and we'll leave time at the end to explore any additional uh, examples any further. For this meeting, we will be providing some information on our organization, but also on natural hazards and Um, we'll also share some information on how this study was completed, how to access the maps, and what this means if you're looking to develop or build. And as mentioned earlier, all of this information, including the draft maps, the bilingual presentation, and a few other resources and tools are available at nation.on.ca slash consultations. And with that, we've got lots more people logged in. So thanks again, guys, for joining us. Uh, let's get this present start, presentation started. So again, welcome everyone, giving access to our public meeting for updated natural hazard mapping of Bear Brook and the North Indian River within the United Counties of Prescott and Russell. Everyone who owns property within or adjacent to the area and our draft maps would have received a letter from us a few weeks ago with an invitation to attend this meeting. And if you didn't receive a letter and are watching all, right now, it's, it's all good, don't worry. You're still welcome to participate and ask any questions. All right, so I'm going to kick off our meeting with a few comments about our organization just to give you a bit of an overview on who we are and what we do. And once I'm done, I'll pass the hot seat over to my colleagues to explain a bit about why and how we map natural hazards. And we'll walk through a few permitting examples for you. So we are one of Ontario's 36 conservation authorities, which operates under provincial legislation called the Conservation Authorities Act. But we also deliver other work through agreements with provincial ministries and our own municipalities to deliver local environmental services. In our region of Eastern Ontario, we work for 16 different municipalities and our jurisdiction is around the South Nation River and its tributaries beginning uh, down south near the headwaters near Brockville 
and ends up in the northern area near Plantagenet, where the river empties into the Ottawa River. You'll also notice in the map that our jurisdiction extends to both the St. Lawrence and Ottawa Rivers. These are recent developments over the last decade where we've extended our jurisdiction to the areas at uh, the request of our member municipalities to help deliver services there, especially floodplain mapping and, and flood forecasting. Which means though we work as watershed managers to manage, conserve and restore natural resources, you can expect that one of the most important parts of our jobs is to protect people and property from natural hazards like flooding, erosion and landslides. We also deliver several services on behalf of our partners, including septic system inspections and drinking water source protection, while also operating eight different dams and other water control structures and managing water response programs to help predict and respond to flood and low water events. The landslide photo on your screen is, is not included in the study area, but it is the largest recorded landslide in Ontario between Castleman and Lemieux which is an area that's been susceptible to landslides for, for centuries and experienced some pretty big events back in the 70s and 90s. And so, for example, this area was mapped by us and is regulated to limit development. And back in the 90s, we were also able to relocate the former village of Lemieux and its residents just one year before the landslide in that photo occurred, about 500 meters from that village main street. And so while the potential landslide area is not included within the study area, it's, it's still a good reminder of why we do this work much like the Ottawa River floods of 2017 and 2019. And like the landslide areas, our staff work uh, to map floodplains and erosion hazards and other areas identified by our municipalities to ensure that whatever new buildings are being approved are being built in the safest places possible. When our staff review development files and proposals, and, and we'll share some examples in a bit, uh, we're not always looking to restrict development like we would in the Castleman to Lemieux area. Our staff are working with the property owner, developer, and municipality to find ways to approve projects when it's safe. And though, you know, we want to provide support for good construction projects, uh, you know, we do have to be clear in saying that this can be very circumstantial. There's not always going to be a one-size-fits-all approach to approvals, and this is why permission is required through a permit uh, before work can proceed. There may be instances where what is proposed to be built may not be safe, whether due to safe access, steep slopes, or flood elevations, for example. However, you know, in most scenarios, projects uh, can be altered, moved, uh, further investigated, or even flood proof so that you're able to receive a building permit. We just want to make sure that when we approve development that it's it's going to protect you uh, and also your investment being your property and the buildings you construct on them. We also need to consider how the alteration of water courses or your shoreline or your construction project might impact your neighbors and their properties. We also deliver environmental monitoring programs that help us report on watershed conditions and environmental health. And I mention this because our planning and regulations team also use this data to make informed decisions when reviewing proposals. And when we know an area is in poor environmental health, we also do our best to work with our partners to help improve the environment through restoration projects. And, and you know, when on this, I do want to make a comment, though, we're very proud of the restoration work we do every year. We are a not for profit organization, and so we do rely on fundraising and project partnerships to help fund this type of work. And so it's through these funding partnerships with government, academia and industry where we're able to work together to improve the local environment. And of course, community stewardship and outreach is an important part of that work. We also deliver a number of different environmental stewardship programs through agreements with our county and municipal partners, including things like roadside tree programs, free woodlot advisory services, storm recovery programs. You can see an example in the photo there, uh, but also water quality improvement programs for farmers that help offer cost share funding for projects that help improve water quality. Some of our programs are specifically funded by select municipalities and delivered in their area. However, many of our services are accessible throughout the region, with our most popular initiative being our tree planting programs, which is often what people know us most for. And we're able to sell trees each spring at reduced rates or take care of all your planting needs when you have more than an acre of tree planting space available. And we were also very pleased to have planted our 4 million tree uh, since 1990 last year. 
A final slide for our overview, we wanted to mention that we are a public land trust and we have been working to protect significant natural spaces in eastern Ontario and we've been acquiring land through partial purchase and donations since about 1970. Many of these properties were acquired for flood mitigation and including areas to construct some of the berms and, and dikes that we know today. Um, but some of our properties were acquired to help keep them from being developed and, and much of our land is forested or contains provincially significant wetlands. At this point, we do own over 13,000 acres of conservation land and we also operate about 15 different day use parks uh, called conservation areas. And I did want to mention that most of our parks are actually on land that was donated to us by people to help protect and conserve their family's natural legacy. And there's more information on all these programs on our website. And with that, I'll pass things over the virtual mic over to Allison McDonald, South Nation Conservation's Managing Director of Approvals to help dive into the public presentation on natural hazard updates. Thanks. Thanks, John. So when we talk about natural hazard mapping, uh, we're generally talking about maps that identify floodplains and erosion hazards in a particular drainage area. So floodplains are low-lying areas found near watercourses that can be susceptible to flooding, especially during spring melts or heavy rain events. Erosion hazards are areas that may potentially be subject to something like slope failure, retreat, um, and may be triggered by a variety of geologic, seismic, or hydrologic man-made factors. The example on the screen shows a house within a regulated area where development would be limited due to the steep ravine found behind the house, which has an unstable slope. Unfortunately, this photo shows a garage that was constructed without a permit from our office in 2016, and this resulted in the garage and the back end of the property falling into the ravine the following year. This was due to the additional loading on the top of slope, which was not assessed by our office. So our organization identifies these potential flood risk areas and slope stability hazards for our local municipalities, and we complete the natural hazard mapping when requested. This work is also funded by all levels of government who work together to identify flood hazards to ensure that we're able to protect people and property and support sustainable new development where it's safe. The guidelines and methodology that we use to complete this work are also established by the province of Ontario, and this ensures consistency in the hazard mapping and permitting that we do across the province. So often uh, natural hazard mapping is updated when these studies are requested in a particular area, usually due to increased development pressure. And this provides developers working in that area with information they will need to safely design a new community. We also get requests from municipalities to study areas that either don't have any mapping or to update older hazard mapping. Usually these older maps were completed in the 1980s. The older studies that we have uh, didn't have access to the high resolution topographical data that we have uh, now or the types of computer models that we're able to use today. Once the mapping is updated by our office, it's included within our conservation authority regulations. And these hazard maps are also included in the official plans and municipal zoning schedules. This important step ensures that a property owner will know about the hazard areas on their property when building, buying, or selling land. So if you received a letter in the mail about these mapping updates, your property may be located within a regulation area for these types of natural hazards. And this means you may need permission through a permit to construct a new building or further develop your property if it's within this regulated area. There's no impact to any current land uses like agriculture, and you can continue to farm productive land, but you will need a permit if you're looking to do something like construct a building, place or remove large amounts of fill, or subdivide land for housing. The permit from the Conservation Authority provides you with steps to safely undertake your project and ensures that people and property will be protected from any of the potential impacts of these natural hazards. It also ensures sustainable development practices will be put in place before a building permit from your municipality can be issued. So just a little bit about how natural hazards are mapped by our office. So we use a combination of on the ground field work and computer modeling. The background data is gathered by our office and includes different types of land use, topography, stream flow information, and precipitation data. We also conduct field surveys to get information on local infrastructure like culverts and bridges. 
For each mapping project, the fieldwork is completed on both public and private properties, always with permission from property owners, and usually at the beginning of our project. The field data that we collect will complement what we call LIDAR mapping, which stands for light detection and ranging. LIDAR provides us with our detailed topographic information that we need to input into the models. We recently coordinated the creation of a new LIDAR mapping, so topographical map, for most of Eastern Ontario through a partnership with all levels of government. Through this initiative, airplanes use remote sensing with pulse lasers that essentially create a 3D elevation model of the full landscape. This topographical information is used and combined with the field data that we collect, the historical information that we have, and the climate stations that we maintain. And a computer model is then used to calculate a stream flow for different precipitation events. We also create extra mapping products from dip to show different storm scenarios, and this is often used by our emergency responders. Our models are reviewed by outside expert engineering consultants before the draft maps are finalized, and this all happens before any of this is made available on our website. Now I'll pass things over to one of our in-house water resource engineers, Shaheen Zan, who's going to explain how the hazards are actually mapped. Thank you, Alison, and good evening. With the use of computer models, we are able to define flood and erosion hazards based on provincial standards, which means that when we are looking at floodplains, we are modeling and mapping a storm event that could create what's called a major 100-year flood, known as the 100-year flood e event standard. This rain and flood event would have a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. For erosion hazards, which is a more permissive regulation, they are mapped based on the 100-year erosion rate standard, which means we are looking at the average annual rate of erosion or recession in a given area over a 100-year time span. After floodplains are mapped and the flow of water is well-defined in different storm scenarios, the regulated area along a river or a stream is generally determined by adding a 15 meter buffer or allowance around the 100 year flood event. A permit is required for development within the entire area where we look at safe access and flood water levels among other considerations. Erosion hazards are areas potentially subject to land regression due to a combination of factors. One thing to note for this study area is that the previous mapping only included an analysis of floodplain and not erosion hazards. With erosion hazards, we are investi investigating the average rate of recession over a 100-year time span. Riverine erosion hazard has three main components, analysis of slope stability, tow erosion, and access allowance. However, erosion hazard mapping will not always have an additional allowance added to, to the regulation area as there are these areas are mapped more conservatively with access considerations included. <clears throat> when creating the regulation area, which you will see in online mapping on our geo portal, you may not always see the different hazards identified. This is because we use the greatest of either hazard to create the regulation area. In many cases, especially within a flat landscape like this area, we are mostly identifying flood hazards. However, there are several areas where the erosion hazard is slightly greater than the floodplain. The Conservation Authority may grant permission for proposed work in a natural hazard area if it is demonstrated to SNC's satisfaction that the proposed work will not affect the control of flooding or erosion. Now I'll turn things back over to John. Hey, thanks, Shaheen. So the map on the screen now is showing the regulations area for the Bear Brook and the North Indian River, again, within the United Counties of Prescott Russell, primarily in Russell and, and Nation municipalities. And so this area includes a 485 square kilometer drainage area with about a 12.8 meter drop in elevation over the 18 kilometers of water courses included, uh, which means that the elevation is changing about, you know, three quarters of a meter every kilometer or so. And one thing to note for this study area is that the Bearbrook watershed is already regulated by the Conservation Authority. 
the last floodplain study was completed for this area in 1978. And the new study did help refine the area due to the higher accuracy of the technology that we have access to today. And so it does capture some of the land use changes over the last decades. However, one thing to note is that erosion hazards were not identified in 1978. And so you'll notice this for a few areas as well uh, in the more specific mapping. Additionally, one area where you won't find old maps to compare with is North Indian Creek. And so if you're still following along, this is going to be that northern tributary that flows uh, through Hammond and, and feeds into the Bear Brook just, just south of Borgia. And this particular area was studied for the first time. And so now I'll show you, if we'll go to the next slide, how to interpret and use our online portal. And so we put together um, you know, a new mapping product, easy to use web app that's linked up on our consultation web page. And this tool is going to help you understand what potential impacts the proposed regulation uh, might have on your property and home. So I'm going to walk through a quick demo just to kind of familiarize everyone with this web tool. So first, you'll need to access SNC's website, uh, nation.own.ca slash consultations, or you can navigate from the home page. Just click that title development and select the public consultation tab. Once you're on the consultation page, we're going to scroll down for the information about the Bear Brook study, uh, as there are separate maps and web links for each of the study areas we're sharing this month. Once you've found the Bear Brook watershed section, you'll see the map with the regulations area depicted in gold. And directly under this image, you're going to want to click on the click here to access the interactive property map. And once we've arrived at that portal, you'll need to accept the terms which describe the mapping area included and also reminds users that this information is displayed as a, a reference tool. It also reminds users that they should contact our office directly to confirm information or if they wish to obtain uh, their own map for their property. And so once accepted, we're going to see the draft data displayed. That blue fill area is the draft floodplain, and the yellow indicates the extent of the regulation area where you may need a permit from the Conservation Authority to build. And once you're here, you know, you can feel free to zoom in and zoom out or, or pan around in different directions, just like you would if you were using Google Maps. Um, and just note, obviously, that for these viewers, they're only going to display information for this particular study area. We can also search for a specific address or intersection using the search bar that's in the upper left hand corner. You can enter your home address uh, to review the location of the map hazards uh, in relation to your property. So uh, let's grab an example from the Bear Brook area. And in this example, we search for the intersection of Johnston Road and Eddyville Road. So when we select the address from the drop down menu, the map is going to automatically zoom to that location and, and drop an orange pin uh, that you can see on the screen. Now we can review that data in detail. We can use that legend button up on the top right uh, to tell us what data we're currently viewing. And we can see here that that draft regulation data is displaying in the gold line and the blue is still that floodplain. If we use the map layers button just beside that legend button, we can change the layers that are going to display on this map. And so for this example, we can turn the draft floodplain layer off, which is the new floodplain that we've just updated. And we can also turn on the current approved regulation, which is that old regulation line from 1978. And that's going to display on this screen as that dash purple line. And so you can play around with this just to compare the current and draft uh, lines and, and see how things have changed during this update. We can also use the map layer menu to compare the current and, and new lines. On this screen, we're going to see that the draft floodplain is in dark blue, while the current or older floodplain is going to show in that brighter blue line. And if you'd like to look up more addresses, the, the best way to start is to start over is, is basically just refresh your web browser just to make sure that that map is reloading uh, before you enter a new address. And of course, PDF maps are also available in detail on our website, which can be downloaded, but the online map will certainly help you access the data a lot quicker. So definitely try it out. And once the you know consultation process and reviews completed, a final version of this regulations area is going to be added to SNC's main geo portal after it's approved by our board of directors. And you can always find a link to that property geo portal on SNC's main homepage. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Claire LeMay, one of our senior planners at South Nation Conservation. Thanks, John. Um, good evening.
I work as part of the team that reviews applications for development. So tonight I'm going to share a couple of examples with you to explain the process for getting a Conservation Authorities Act permit for development in the regulated area. Our definition of development includes new buildings, additions to existing buildings, site grading, or addition and removing of fill. If you're planning any work like this in or near the regulated area on your property, or if you're looking to buy property with a regulated area, the first step is to call or email the South Nation office. Our staff will let you know if you need a permit. I'll share two examples of what the permit application process is like for landowners wanting to do work in or near the regulated areas. On this slide, we have an example of a property that has floodplain and erosion hazards. The floodplain is shown in blue and the regulated area is shown in yellow. In this example, the owner wanted to build a garage. His first step was to call South Nation to consult on the required setback from the slope and the river. After the first phone call, he provided a basic sketch of the proposed garage size and location. Because the garage was proposed quite close to the edge of the slope, South Nation's permitting officer noted that an engineer would need to complete a study and determine the safe setback distance from the erosion hazard. South Nation also asked for architectural plans for the garage, a sediment and erosion control plan, and a description of the work. The next step in the process is to prepare the supporting information. This might be something that you can do yourself, but it can often require hiring an expert. The landowner in this example hired a local engineering firm to prepare the sediment and erosion control plan and a slope stability study. The engineering firm also measured elevations on the property and confirmed that the proposed garage was outside of the flood hazard. The landowner drew the building plans himself, which he also used for his building permit application. Once a complete application is received, staff will notify you of the appropriate fees based on our fee schedule, which is publicly available on our website. The complexity of the file and the size of the development helps to determine the level of review needed and the corresponding fee. More complex applications like this one are reviewed by SNC's technical review team. The review team may have questions for the landowner or the experts who prepared the plans and studies. In this case, we were able to resolve our questions via email with the engineer. One thing to note is that not all permit applications will require additional technical review. Once the review is complete, you will receive the permit by email. It may include conditions like a follow-up visit after the work is completed. Most permits are issued with a two-year timeline to complete the work, and it's possible to ask for an extension if you don't end up completing your project within that timeline. So the landowner in our example here was able to build his new garage safely outside of the floodplain and with an appropriate setback from the slope. He knows that his investment is safe because of our review. In our second example, the landowner wanted to build an extension to the existing house. She contacted SNC by email to ask if she would need a permit. Now, because the regulation line overlaps with the location of the existing house, we needed to know the exact location of the proposed work. South Nation provided a digital map to the landowner's architect so they could check if the proposed addition was inside the SNC regulated area. The architect recommended adjusting the building layout so that the addition would be entirely outside the regulated area. This meant there was no requirement for a permit from South Nation and that the addition was located well away from the hazard area. I'll pass things back to John now, who will share some contact information and important links before closing the meeting. Awesome, thanks Claire. And uh, as we're nearing the end of our presentation, I do want to remind viewers that they are still able to use that question function if they're interested uh, so that our team can respond to any questions you might have. And 
of course, thank you to the team members working in the back end who've been chatting with participation participants rather during this session. Uh, this study was completed at the request of the United Counties of Prescott and Russell, and it is funded by the counties, the Conservation Authority, and has received support from the Government of Canada through the Flood Hazard Identification and Mapping Program. So feel feel free, you know, to connect with our team at any time directly, but you're also welcome to contact our county partners, including Louis Prevost, Director of Planning and Forestry, and Dominique Lefebvre, uh, Manager of Planning. We also welcome one-on-one -on -one meetings between March 1st and 22nd, which can be organized virtually by telephone or, or in person at our administrative office uh, in Finch. There is a request form online. If you scroll to the bottom of the, the consultation webpage, you can there select your preferred meeting time, whether it be morning, afternoon, evenings, and we'll come back with a suggestion on a weekday time uh, that would work best for you. And as part of that request, if you're able to include a little bit of information, we'll be able to make sure that we get the right team members uh, to meet with you, which can include our engineers or planners, for example. Nous sommes heureux également euh, d'organiser des réunions en anglais ou en français, alors euh, n'hésitez pas à nous faire savoir ce qui, euh, ce qui vous convient le mieux. Et puis maintenant que nous sommes arrivés à la fin de la présentation, nous allons euh, vérifier vos questions. So, now that we've made it through the end of the presentation, this is usually where we love to answer any submitted questions that you might have, but I, I do see that you guys have been pretty easy on us tonight. So, I mean, thank you for that. But I'll, I'll get our team members back up on screen here um, and we'll, we'll stay on for a few minutes if anyone wants to send a question our way. And what I might do, uh, seeing that things look like they're responded to, is I'll just toss out a couple questions and, and see where things land with our team members. So um, in this particular area, I mean, it's it's mostly agricultural land uses and, and some residential, uh, mixed residential throughout the area. Uh, you know, a common question we get, especially from farmers working in the area is, is what does this mean uh, for their, their farm? What does this mean for their current agricultural operations? Um, I wonder, Allison, or if anyone else, if you wanted to try and make a response for that. Yeah, it's pretty common uh, in our watershed, in our communities, that you'll see these floodplains in agricultural lands. And um, generally, it doesn't have very much effect on that kind of uh, productive land. So you can continue to farm. You probably have been farming land in floodplains. You probably enjoy that to some degree, as long as the water gets off the fields quick enough. But uh, yeah, it's OK to continue to farm in floodplains. You really want to just be aware, um, as Claire, I think, helped to show with her examples that if you're placing or removing large amounts of fill within that that regulated area if you want to construct a building um, if you're looking at expanding an existing building that's that's the time you want to pick up the phone give us a call and just talk it through with with one of our staff first so generally if you're if you're doing standard agricultural practices not too much of an impact you're probably very much aware of what parts of your property are wet in the spring and uh, really it only affects you if you're looking at at some of those things i mentioned yeah no for sure what about um you know you mentioned giving us a call and, and obviously for any scenario we offer what we call pre-consultation which which is just a free service where you can connect with us and ask us any questions i wonder if anyone wants to provide some comments on what that experience usually looks like uh, for the average person reaching out to our office yeah, I can, or Claire, if you want to talk about pre-consultation. Sure. Um, so generally, we get calls from, from property owners uh, wishing to do certain types of work on their property. Um, the, that can include something like a new dwelling, an, an entirely new house, or it could be something really simple like um, replacing a culvert in your entrance driveway. Um, all of these things are good reasons to give us a call, everything in between, um, garden sheds or um, if you're adding fill onto your property, doing some landscaping, building a retaining wall, those kinds of things would be a reason to give us a call to see if a permit is needed for the work that you're proposing. And that uh, 
pre-consultation can be an in-person meeting, but most of what we do is over the phone and by email. So you can send us, you know, a photograph or a sketch that you draw by hand, and then we'll pick up the phone and call you and talk through your proposal and let you know um, what kind of hazards there are on your property and what considerations there would be in the permit process if a permit is required. That's great. What about, um, you know, what about a prospective buyer? You know, if someone's looking to buy land and uh, they're looking at this area and they're wondering where the natural hazards might exist or maybe other en environmental features on the landscape is, you know, what would you say to a prospective buyer or real estate agent uh, looking for information? Yeah, I think you read my mind. I was going to suggest <laughs> that. Um, we do have a great service called Property Inquiry and it's really popular. Um, we do... I don't know, maybe upwards towards 100 of these um, a year. It provides uh, essentially a letter to someone, either an owner of a property, someone looking to purchase a property, and it discusses if there's any natural hazards, any regulated areas, um, gives you information about permitting requirements. It's a really great product for lawyers, for real estate agents, and just for any kind of savvy purchaser of property. It's very affordable. Um, you have something in writing. You have something you can either, you know, keep on your file or use to sell your property. So you can include it with uh, information to potential buyers. Uh, so that's a really nice service that we do offer. And it allows you to have that sort of document in writing that confirms everything for you. Um, and if you just want, like Claire was saying, kind of a verbal check-in, that's the pre-consultation service where we just sort of chat on the phone, take a look at what you want to do um and give you a sense of what your next steps might be so there are two different options depending on the level of certainty you need and what you want to use that information for in the future mm -hmm. yeah that's perfect and I, I guess i would add uh you know especially for anyone who followed along with the web mapping demonstration you know if, if you are just looking um you know curiosity or, or wondering what sort of environmental protections are on your land or near your land you can always use our online geo portal it's it's always going to be linked up somewhere on our main page it's called an interactive property viewer and so you can access our regulations layer in the same way that you would uh, on our consultation page but um, that portal also gives you some insight into you know where there are provincially significant wetlands where there are water courses and and where there are, are public lands for example so if if you're just uh you know from like curio curiosity view i mean you're welcome just to try that out as well but uh, i think at the end of the day we're always here to help um regardless of the scenario um i don't see any additional questions and so obviously we are just talking amongst ourselves um so that's always fun but maybe to close could we make a few comments on you know flood proofing measures i mean sometimes people reach out wondering what that might actually entail I, you know it's not always possible in every scenario but what might a flood proofing measure be if someone is you know in a floodplain or or knows they have a lot of flooding issues especially in the spring what are some of the things that they could consider for their house? Anyone want to take that one? Sounds like a good Sandra question. She wants mm -hmm. to. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Sean. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, the first step, if you want to build and you're close to the floodplain, would be the pre-consultation. And when you uh, meet with us, we will give you some uh, uh, advice on how to flood proof. The first thing that we will give you is the floodplain elevation. And then the best, uh, the better way to flood proof is to build a higher than the flood play elevation. One of our uh, uh, requirements is that the lowest opening be at least 30 centimeters uh, higher than the flood plane. That's to ensure that if something happens, you, you are not going to get water in the basement through the through the main uh, through the windows or doors. Yes, so that's one of the main uh, considerations. Another consideration is if you are building in the floodplain, we have to make sure that the foundation is a uh, uh, is. It, retain, it maintains water outside the the outside your basement, so that that's what we call it hydrostatic pressure in in a, a, you know engineering talking. But uh, that for that to do that in general is required is required to have a, a the foundation designed by an engineer, and uh, I think I, I, that's uh, good. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is any other questions, I'm happy to answer. 
Yeah, I mean, it looks like people are giving us an easy pass tonight, but of course, we welcome those one-on-one -on -one discussions, right? Often what we do uh, when we do these consultations is people are already have an idea of of, of how they want to develop their property or, or where they were thinking of severing a lot off. And so, you know, feel free to to fill out that form and, and request a meeting or just give us a shout and, and we'll line up a time that works best. And we can explore that scenario uh, specifically with you just to help guide you through that process. And for anyone who who lives in the, the area and, and knows it's susceptible to flooding every year, you know, we do offer a, a flood forecasting and warning program. It's something we deliver on behalf of our municipal partners to help give them early and advance notice of potential flood events. But uh, we do have uh, a newsletter online on our website that you can subscribe to. Those alerts are always available to you as well. And we always do post them on social media. Um, so if you are following our accounts, you can make sure to stay up to date on when we expect the spring melt to come through, what we're expecting in terms of water levels and, and flooding potential, and it's definitely something to to be mindful of. Now, I'm willing to to wrap if if my colleagues are good. I'm seeing some nods. All right. Well, listen, guys, that this does bring us to the end of our presentation. Thanks so much for making time for us tonight. This presentation is recorded, and so it will be posted on our website so you can view it later or share it with your friends. And uh, you can also find it on our YouTube channel. So, merci de votre attention et bonne soirée tout le monde.